Connor, welcome right. to the show. Thanks for having me. Let's uh, let's start with how you got into uh, buying and selling stocks. So from a kid, and then I want to talk about some of the stuff you did in college, co- competing, and but how how did this become your world? Sure. You know, I think I've always been really into sort of strategy games. I uh, still am, yeah. <laughs> uh, admittedly. Um, any any kind of strategy game. So when I was younger, my first sort of intellectual passion was chess. I was a very serious chess player when I was younger. Okay. And when I uh, got to high school, my freshman year, I took an economics elective and really enjoyed it. And as part of that, we sort of did a, a virtual stock market game. You know, you you pick stocks, you compete against your classmates, you compete against other schools. And I, I really didn't know anything about investing at the time, but it really sort of opened my eyes to, wow, this is a really complicated, essentially strategy game. And, you know, the, the board essentially changes, you know, because the world changes. And it really just sparked a fascination in me. And, uh, you know, I started researching stocks mostly through sort of retail oriented sites like the street.com and the Motley Fool and started reading books. Uh, and, it, you know, my, my interest and passion sort of just grew from there. So by the time I was a senior in high school, I was spending, you know, I'd say at least a couple hours a day reading about investing, you know, posting things on retail oriented sites. And I had done um, recently well on uh, one of those sites, The Motley Fool, and I sort of got an opportunity to intern uh, for that company. And so I sort of took this unusual decision. I uh, took a gap year and I spent about uh, about six months at the street.com in New York City. It's been about a, a similar amount of time at the Motley Fool in Alexandria, Virginia. And it was sort of this amazing period of time for me where, you know, I I spent a lot of time on those sites in high school, really loved investing, didn't know a lot, but, you know, a year later I matured a lot. I knew exactly what I wanted to do and really had a big advantage, you know, as a freshman at Harvard because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I had more work experience than graduating seniors, and it really set me up well to sort of continue my investing journey. And my passion's really grown every every year since. So, when you were learning in high school, like, can you remember what you were learning? Were you learning the strategy of business and how you acquire customers and how you deliver product, and or were you looking at like balance sheets and profit and loss statements and learning business that way? Like, how were you learning it at that age about business? Yeah, it was definitely an iterative process. I mean, from the beginning, I really knew very little. Yeah. And so I was trying to learn the basics, right? I was trying to learn the basics about, you know, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statements. And I was, but I, I you know, while I wanted to learn and I was, I was definitely uh, learning those basics that are crucial, I also wanted to sort of dip my toe in the water and, and um, understand how, why stocks were moving. And so I think, you know, with a lot of investors, particularly young ones who get into it early, you start with more narrative-based investing, right? You like a company, you like their products, sort of a Peter Lynch, invest in what you know kind of uh, yeah. mentality. The first stock I ever bought was Buffalo Wild Wings, uh, <laughs> of which I was an avid consumer at the time. And, um, you know, it was fun to watch that company and like listen to their conference calls and, you know, sort of just see that develop over time. And so I think that's a great way for anyone to get into investing is, you know, buy a few shares in some of your favorite companies, follow them, try to understand them, analyze their financial statements. And it's a more active way of learning. And that was really beneficial for me. Yep. All right. So you get to Harvard and you won a series of competitions while you were in college. I didn't want to gloss over that. Like how are the competitions structured and how did you win them? You know, I was, I was very fortunate and candidly probably had a pretty unfair advantage because I, I had worked for over a year in the industry, like literally working full time. Yep. And then I get to freshman year at Harvard and there's a really great sort of investing uh, group there called the Harvard Financial Analyst Club. And so I plugged myself into that group um, as a freshman. I joined their board, um, I think as a sophomore and you know, eventually became president of the club. But I got, I got sort of put into this great community of really smart, hungry people who you know, in many ways, were were very much like me. They they loved investing and they wanted to learn, and sort of you all helped each other. But there were a lot of opportunities to sort of compete, um, w- whether it be investing competitions from an idea perspective or actual trading competitions. I did both, 
um, both on the Harvard campus and intercollegiate competitions. So there were many competitions at Harvard between various investing clubs where they'd bring in investment banks to judge them and recruiting types of competitions. There was uh, a pretty fun sort of um, competition held at uh, Cornell that we did amongst most of sort of the Ivy League schools. And, you know, it was particularly fun to uh, beat the Wharton team, which I think, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they didn't love that so much, but that was a point of pride for, for Harvard because, you know, Harvard doesn't have any financial courses. They don't right. even offer accounting, uh, which is incredible. Really? Um, they don't. You can take accounting through MIT and it's a lottery system, complete luck. Um, I actually did was on the wrong side of that luck, yeah. so I didn't even get it. But so it was really all sort of self-taught and through, you know, the investment clubs and people passing passing along knowledge. But it was a really great experience, and um, uh, some of my best friends are still from you know those investing clubs that I participated in at Harvard. And were you basically like picking like you had a certain time period you had to pick some stocks, and whoever had the most returns over that time period won the competition. Uh, so most of the competitions were idea based. So the okay. one I mentioned, for example, at Cornell, they they gave you um, several different stocks to choose from, and you had to decide whether you're going to go long or short or or essentially hold. And you yeah. had so you basically had to make an investment case and argue for what the fair value is, and therefore what you should do on it. Yep. And so it's all about how deep is your diligence, how detailed is your model, did you think about all of the qualitative factors? Did you express those qualitative factors accurately in a quantitative model? And how much thought did you really put into it? And so everyone's trying to like have their unique angle and their edge. And, you know, I think it's, um, it's a really great exercise and certainly made, made me a lot better, but it was also a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. So you get out and then I might skip a little, but then you went to Scopia. I did. Was that your first hedge fund that you worked at? No. So, you know, um, I think, experiences really compound. And so I, I had that really amazing gap year and it it brought me, again, sort of more work experience than graduating seniors. And I was able to really kind of leverage that into great internship opportunities in college. So my freshman year, um, I worked for a fund called um, Osmium Partners in San Francisco. So it was a long, short equity, small cap focused fund, um, still run by a really smart guy. And at the time, I joined this online investment community, mostly of buy side managers called Sum Zero. I think at the time I was the youngest person to ever join, but I had written up this stock called Spark Networks, which was um, sort of an early version. It was an online dating site. Um, their, their most uh, valuable asset was a Jewish focused dating site. And it happened to be one of the largest holdings, if not the largest of this fund at the time. And so we started sort of interacting through the site and uh, you know d discussing the business. And so you know probably 12 message threads in, I said, hey, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm actually a freshman in college and I'd love to come work for you. It seems like we have some overlap. And, you know, he was kind enough to, to give me a job essentially. And I learned a lot from him, really great guy. And sophomore year, sort of similar situation, a different fund um, based in Los Angeles. Again, small cap focused, long short equity. And then, you know, junior summer, I worked for Goldman Sachs and their special situations group, sort of again, sort of on balance sheet investing. And then I was able to leverage those experiences into uh, joining in a full-time role at Scopia Capital, a long short equity hedge fund based in New York City, which was a really great experience as well. And I spent uh, a little under four years there. What did you, before we get into Alta, what did you learn maybe at Scopia or the hedge funds you'd worked before that kind of, it sounds like you had kind of learned how to buy stocks and learned how to value businesses, but like, what did you learn once you got to like, the big leagues and got on the the trading floor of these of these hedge funds. Well, I, I had read every book I could on fundamental investing. Yeah, you know, I I had read every sort of super investor out there. So I I think I had a pretty good underlying investment philosophy and in how I wanted to kind of view the world. However, that you know that doesn't make up for the daily grind and the the details that only go into being a practitioner. Yeah. at a large, you know, multi-billion dollar hedge fund. And that's what I really got at Scopia. You know, they had a, a very long uh, and an impressive track record and both on the long and the short side. And so I learned things like how to build really detailed, you know, financial models and really dig deep into the unit economics of any business. You know, I learned how to talk to a management team, how to grill them on certain things, how to read body <laughs> language. Um, you know, I learned how to incorporate alternative data into our process. Um, I sort of learned the ins and outs of 
uh, of the job, which really I, I, you, know, you can't pick up reading. And yeah. um, it was a really valuable time for me. Okay, I'm going to ask you a loaded question because you kind of just said it, but what is your investment philosophy? How long you got? <laughs> um, no, you know, look, I think at the end of the day, um, what I try to do is I try to find really high quality businesses that are in some way misunderstood by the market. And I don't think that's entirely unique, but I think one thing that we try to do at Alta Fox is try to not only identify them, but also sort of correct the misperception and do something about it, right? So if you find a really great business and people are not recognizing it because they're not allocating capital as efficiently as they should, right? They may be sitting on amazing reinvestment opportunities, but perhaps the business is you know, paying out cash flow as a dividend, which is not the best and highest use of capital. This was exactly the case at a business called Collector's Universe, for example, which was our first formal activist foray. And you know it, it, that is something that is not uh, readily apparent in the financials necessarily, right? Because you have to have a little bit of imagination. You have to really dig into the business to understand, okay, this is what the business looks like today, but what could the business look like with better, um, better reinvestment, more aligned management, things like this. And so we identified a high quality business. It had a misperception. We bought a large stake. We became an activist and we started pushing for change. And I think that's emblematic of sort of our philosophy. We, we prefer not to have to go down the activism route. It's sort of a um, last resort, but finding high quality businesses that are misunderstood and then trying to unlock that value is central to our central to the investment philosophy and central to our process. We're going to kind of bounce around, but we're just going to keep going on this. How does something become a great idea that then has to go from, damn, we're going to have to become activists on this idea? Like what's the bridge that kind of triggers that? It's a long process. You know, our, our um, strong preference is to work collaboratively with management teams and we have great relationships with most of our management teams. You know, I would say if something gets to the point of activism, it very much, uh, there's been a lot of dialogue between point A and point B. Yeah. <laughs> point B being activism because it's a lot of work. It's, it's a little bit unfortunate every time it happens. And I think normally um, there should be compromise that results in value creation for all stakeholders. However, if you have an opportunity where you have deep conviction that you're correct on whether it be you know, the alignment is not correct, the compensation is not correct, the reinvestment opportunities are not being handled correctly, and you have people that just are unwilling to embrace reality, are unwilling to do the right thing. In that scenario, we have occasionally been forced to sort of be a formal activist and say, look, this is, you know, a company is owned by its shareholders, not by its management, not by its board. It's owned by its shareholders and you know, the people in charge, namely the board, have a responsibility to those shareholders. And if they're not acting in the best interest of shareholders, sometimes the large shareholders have to remind them of who owns the company and, and force them to do the right thing. Yep. All right. So you leave um, Scopia and you start Alta. Uh, what is Alta? How do you describe Alta to people? Alta Fox. Yeah. So Alta Fox, you know, we launched April of 2018 with about 10 million of assets under management. And, you know, it's a long, short equity focused investment firm, um, you know, trying to find great opportunities around the globe. You know, we're looking for great businesses that are, for whatever reason, mispriced, often due to structural misperceptions about the business. And we're trying to unlock that value. And I think that underlying philosophy has stayed pretty consistent since 2018. You know, we've grown, we've evolved, we've added a lot to our capabilities, but, you know, we're still, we're still grinding the same way uh, I did as a one-man band uh, to start. And, you know, we're going all over the globe. So one day we'll be researching a consumer business in the U.S. The next day we'll be researching, you know, and some obscure business in Sweden. It's a lot of fun. You get to analyze businesses all day and try and understand how the world changing is impacting your portfolio and um, sort of the normalized earnings and therefore valuation of a whole set of businesses. It's a lot of fun. And like, what is a typical day for you? Are you still deep in the analyzation of these businesses? Or are you now managing people? Or are you always going to be like in the, the juice of finding these value companies? My dream day would be to spend, you know, the whole day just in SEC documents and <laughs> in Excel and, and just being an analyst. Like that's, 
that's my favorite kind of day. It doesn't yeah. doesn't always work out that way. Yeah. Um, now that we've grown, but you know, I've got a really talented team and we work very collaboratively. And um, you know, I'm really proud of the work they've done. And you know, I t- I, there's no real typical day, but look, a typical week is spending a lot of time talking to management teams. You know, we we speak to on the research team. We probably speak to at least 15 CEOs or CFOs a week, like very, very active. And so we're talking to a lot of different businesses and a lot of different industries, which helps us develop sort of a bottom up view of what's happening in the economy and the market, which, you know, informs where we think the most attractive opportunities are. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of talking to CEOs. It's a lot of getting in the models with the analysts. It's, you know, really comparing investment opportunities relative to each other, right? Because there's a lot of good opportunities out there, but we're looking for the most exceptional ones. So I think it's important to have a really systematic process for comparing the risk and the reward of companies across totally different industries of different sizes. And I, you know, I think we've developed a pretty rigorous process of doing that and ultimately having sort of a quantitative output of how attractive a business is across many criteria that we've sort of refined and and um, analyzed over time. Okay. To the level that you're willing to share, I want to talk about that process. And like, from my standpoint, you know, I buy industrial real estate. So I'm thinking like, what markets should I be in? Maybe what sides of town, but my like pool of what I'm looking to buy is kind of small. When I think of the stock market globally is like, there are hundreds of thousands of stocks. One, like, how do you know what to focus on? And two, if you get excited about something on a Monday, why is that not trumped by the next company that rolls in on a Tuesday? Like, how do you, how does it all work? Well, I'd say we start by looking for exceptional businesses. Okay. And that's really important because look, um, an exceptional business doesn't always mean an exceptional stock and vice versa, right? There can be low quality businesses that are cheap and can do well, but I prefer to search for really excellent businesses. And the reason is, if you find a really excellent business with true competitive advantages that can protect sort of uh, return on invested capital from competition over time, you can often make multiples of your money because you have this great niche that you dominate and you know your competitive advantages prevent um, that return on, on capital from being eroded over time by price competition or, or whatever else it may be. So we, we love to search for excellent businesses because you tend to be able to hold them longer. Uh, versus a cheap stock, which may re-rate, but then you got to flip it and sell it. That's, you know, it's not that we've never done that, but that's not core to our our strategy. So we're looking for dominant businesses with a competitive advantage that we can understand. That could be a network effect. It could be a cost advantage. It could be some intangible brand. It could be switching costs, whatever that may be. We're trying to really understand that and talk to the customers, talk to the suppliers, talk to um, anyone we can in the industry to better understand How does this business really make money? How does that compare versus the competitors? And ultimately, the end goal is to understand the qualitative aspects of the business, which results in quantitative outputs for what we think normalized earnings and free cash flow look like on a sort of medium to long-term time horizon. And if we know that, then we can sort of wrap our head around what that business is worth, translate that into sort of an IRR over a uh, forecasted time period. And then we're comparing a stream of IRRs that we've calculated based on our own estimates alongside other factors, right? Like, well, what's the risk we have to take on to achieve that IR? What's the quality of the business? What's the catalyst ranking? There's a lot of different things we look at, but we're trying to build our investment brain of IRRs based on the work that we've done. And then we're trying to account for all the other factors outside of IRRs so that we we can have a systematic process of developing the absolute best portfolio that we can. Yep. Are you, are you starting with like an industry going, we're looking for an exceptional business within this industry, or you're kind of saying I'm agnostic to that. I just want to find exceptional businesses that have some type of tailwind behind them. Um, very much the latter. Yeah. You know, we're, we're agnostic, we're generalists, you know, there are industries that we typically avoid or don't do a lot in just because they tend to not have a lot of exceptional businesses with durable moats that we can understand. Yeah. You know, so we don't we don't do a ton in say financials or energy or biotech for example, not to say that there aren't great businesses, but it's just not really our wheelhouse. But uh, you know, we'll we'll go anywhere. Geography, industry, um and you tend to sort of bounce around. Like once you find a theme you really like or a really good business, 
we'll go talk to every operator or ex operator in the industry and say, you know, where would you invest your own money? Right. And, you know, occasionally it's been interesting. You know, if uh, we, we had a business um, a few years ago and we asked all the competitors, you know, what's the competitor you most admire? You know, it turns out a lot of these guys were investing in this other competitor that they really admired. And we we're like, you know, maybe we should study that business. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we, you end up bouncing around. But, you know, if you talk to a lot of management teams and sort of follow um, the businesses that are that are winning over time, some of those businesses will end up um, eroding their profits because competition will come in and sort of destroy whatever super profits they were earning from the time, but some of them will prove to be durable. Yep. And those are the businesses we really try to understand. So a lot of the times we analyze a business, it seems like they're really good, but there's no actual competitive mode. And more often than not, that's going to be the case. But if, you, if you're analyzing you know, hundreds of companies over the course of a year, there's going to be a few that really stick out and hopefully you get it uh, right more often than you're wrong. How quickly into kind of looking at a company now, can y'all get to a no? Is this happening in days, weeks? Do you ever go like months before it dawns on you that, damn, we just wasted a lot of time on this? In terms of getting to a no, it, yeah, it can be anywhere from days to to weeks, potentially even months. That would be unusual. We try to kill ideas quickly though, right? If there's something that is very much outside of our wheelhouse, if it's not going to be in our circle of competence, if there are really glaring governance issues that don't seem even worth fighting over, then um, you know that that'd be another reason why we pass. We try to kill ideas quickly because there's so many things to look at. How quickly in um, uh, is there is there like common reasons why you get to a no quickly, like or is it different for every business? So uh, it's different for every business, but like examples would be, you know, maybe we like a business, but maybe the customer concentration is just too high. You know, if somebody has a 70% customer concentration, that's going to be a looming risk over that business forever. Yeah. In a way that just might, we might not be able to get comfortable with. Because even if we have a 90% confidence, that's not going to be a problem. We got a 10% scenario where we're in real trouble. And that might not be something we're comfortable with. That will score very poorly on sort of our, our, our uh, risk rating, which yeah. goes into alongside IRR and other factors. And so that might be a re an example of a reason. It could be that you know, the management team just doesn't understand um, capital allocation and they're actually destroying value in the business, right? Maybe they're trying to grow really fast, which sounds good, but if you don't have um, a competitive advantage and you're throwing a lot of capital at a competitive business, you can actually destroy value you know, through growth. And so if you're not earning the right return on invested capital, if you don't have a framework for thinking about it, there's a lot of management teams that just destroy value. So there's a lot of reasons why we'll kill an idea, but we try to get to it as quickly as possible so that we can divert attention to you know the potentially exceptional businesses out there. People kind of are starting to know who you are. So when you call, are you calling a management team before you start buying their stock? Is that a prerequisite? Is it is it deal by deal, or do you usually call them after and go, "Hey, we're we're now partners. Let's get to know each other." We certainly speak to pretty much every management team before we buy the stock. And yeah. in many cases, we try to visit with the management teams. You know, it was a little different during COVID and things like that. But I think it's really valuable to be able to sit down across from a management team, see what their office is like, see what the employees are like. I think that's really valuable and develop a relationship over time. Because then when you go to the management team and you say, hey, you know, we're, we're a material holder and we have some concerns about this capital allocation. We actually think you could create more value doing this. Hopefully there's a relationship there and they'll sort of value your, your opinion and have a real dialogue about it. But we are definitely trying to engage management teams early in the process to, because it, it's a crucial part of, of investing. I mean, a great business with a bad management team can often be a very bad investment. So yeah. it's, it's so critical that I think it's important to understand management's mindset as early on in the process. Whether it's a call or an on-site visit, do do public companies have to let you in? Like, do they have to take your call and do they have to let you visit their office? Or they, could they be like, sorry, we're working on stuff. We just can't talk to you. Uh, they certainly do not have to do anything, yeah. though that would be a, a warning signal in and of itself, yeah. right? If a public company does not want to talk to engaged shareholders that could be, you know, a material part of their cap table and, you know, are active, you know, do real research and are trying to to create value, that in and of itself would be a warning sign. Uh, you know, depending on the size of the company, your first interaction could be anywhere from 
a junior investor relations person to the CEO of the company. It really just depends. But um, it would be unusual for a company to not talk to you at all, though we've seen everything happen. <laughs> yeah. And from like the time you reach out to them, are you reaching out to them on like a Monday for a call Wednesday or are you usually like getting on a call or reaching out and it's weeks before you're able to get someone on the line? Uh, really depends on the size of the company. The yeah. smaller the company, typically the the earlier the turnaround and, and vice versa. But, you know, we're we're typically trying to set up a bunch of calls really kind of for the next week often. Yeah. And we're doing our work to really ramp up in the process. So we've done enough work to think it's really interesting. And then we try to be really prepared for our questions. Because I think a lot of investors will set up calls with a management team or they'll go to a conference and they'll sort of just flip through the slide deck and hear the investor pitch, which I think is a colossal waste of time because you know those are filings you could have read in advance. And if I'm a management team, frankly, and investors asking to speak with me and they're asking questions that could be answered from the 10K, I'm probably not going to take their call again. So we try to be really prepared. We try to ask good questions. And I think you know, hopefully that comes across that we're thoughtful and they're more likely to take our call the next time. Yeah. Um, I'm just fascinated on this idea because we picked one idea, which was buy class B industrial kind of in the sunbelt and we stuck to it. And when I think of the um, abundance of ideas that you could have at any one time, I'm still trying to get, I'm trying to ask it in the right way is like, how are you ranking these? Is the team meeting daily? And you're like, here's our 15 ideas and number 14 is now number two. Like, how do you stay focused on like the few that are going to matter? Well, I think that's something we've really developed over time. So we have a quantitative process. So we have um, a, a, a sort of software program that we've customized over time okay. that basically takes um, five different factors in addition to IRR. So our IRR is coming out from our, uh, our own estimates of normalized earnings and free cash flow on typically a three to five year basis. And so every company will have a an IRR that's the weighted average probabilities of a, typically a bull, bear, and base case. So that's your IRR. But obviously, that's just a part of the story because how much risk is there? What's quality of the management? There's a lot of different factors. And those factors we quantitatively rank on a one to five scale. And they're weighted differently. And they're combined with IRR alongside portfolio level constraints. And it all ends up sp spitting out an output in terms of this is what your position size should be. Now, we don't follow that like gospel. We don't always agree exactly, <laughs> but it is a very systematic, quantifiable way of comparing investment opportunities against each other in a framework that everyone on the research team understands, which leads to great discussions, right? So our investment meetings are a lot of fun. We talk about, you know, is this business a higher quality business than that business? Totally different industry. Is this management team a better management team than that? We end up arguing over scores in a healthy way because all of these factors ultimately um, go into what is the risk adjusted reward of this investment, which is, the, you know, the foundational block for what is the best risk adjusted return for our portfolio. Yeah. How many uh, ideas maybe you or you can pick somebody on the team like how many are you usually working on at any one point in time like 10 100 um so you know we have typically 15 to 20 stocks roughly in the portfolio okay. at any given time that's the live we have three types of ideas at the portfolio obviously 15 to 20 then an ideas list the ideas list are names we have irrs on them we've analyzed the normalized earnings and free cash flow we've done basically all the work but it's just not attractive enough relative to our existing portfolio. So there's a there's an optimal size that's that's um, that that comes out of our process, but it's it's less than everything in the portfolio. And so we call those the ideas. The ideas, you know, we've probably got um, close to a hundred ideas now. These are companies we've done a lot of work on. They're just not good enough by our own estimation and process to be in the portfolio. And then we've got what we call the monitor list. And the monitor list is one step down from ideas. These are businesses we think are really interesting, potentially exceptional businesses that are worthy of doing work, but we just haven't put them through the full investment process yet. Yeah. So um, how many ideas is someone on the team working on? Depends, but I would say you know they're generally jug juggling between three to five ideas at any given time. And again, they're trying to kill, kill ideas as quickly as possible. But then if we find something that really seems to be interesting, it's possible that we could all drop everything and work on the same idea together. Yeah. Because a great idea is really valuable. Is, um, 
are there idea meetings like I, I picture the show Billions where like they were all the hedge fund guys were meeting in like a room once a quarter to like share ideas. Does that exist in your world? Does that really even happen? I'm not sure it's as uh, glamorous as Billions, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, we have meetings on a weekly basis and like a lot of them are, you know, fiery debates in, in, in a good way. I, I like for the investment meetings to get kind of spirited. I think that's a good thing. You know, everybody respects each other, but like. We're going to come after each other's ideas pretty hard. We're going to really challenge the assumptions and, you know, it's either going to hold up to scrutiny or not. And I think that's really important because, you know, this business is really competitive and there's not really room to have, you know, to get emotional about ideas or to, you know, be afraid of attacking an assumption. You know, like we, we really try to be aggressive and that goes for everybody, you know, in, including myself. If you can share, if not, that's fine. You said there's five kind of categories that it's weighted on. Are you able to even speak to the categories? I've shared. I, I can share a few. Okay. Because we, I've and I've mentioned a couple. So obviously, IRR is is one outside of that. But you know, look, risk is a basic, very basic category that we quantify. We have a checklist of things that we look at that go into assessing risk based on various mistakes we've made in the past, where maybe we overlooked something, and also just very basic factors. Um, you know, things like catalyst, right? Do we think that maybe we think something's cheap, but is there a reason to think that this will be corrected in the near term? Um, if so, that might be, a, for example, maybe maybe we have alternative data. Maybe we think the company will report much better earnings than people fear. Uh, that might be a good catalyst score and or vice versa. Maybe we think the company is very cheap, but in the near term, uh, the market may not see that. Well, there's going to be less of an urgency, maybe it should be a smaller position relative to everything else. So catalyst would be another one. You know, the quality of the business, you know, we care a lot about that. Um, uh, so there's there's a whole, there's, there's, there's a couple more, but yeah. uh, you know, the point is we try to really quantify all of them because yeah. I think a lot of investors sort of have a, a sh shoot from the hip uh, approach to position sizing. And I think maybe that can work if you're doing it by yourself, right? If, you, if you're a one man band and, every idea you've analyzed. And so you're able to easily in your head compare. I still don't love that approach, but when you're a team and you're trying to have really clear discussions around, is this idea better than that idea? I think it's really important to have a structured framework for that debate because totally different businesses, geographies, everything else, like you need to um, strip that debate down to its core, core elements in yeah. order to try and try and have a, a chance at getting to the right conclusion. What um, you've seen and you've talked to thousands of CEOs at this point, what are some common characteristics of great CEOs in your opinion? And is it is it business dependent or size dependent or is it a personality or a, a core kind of, you know, core traits to the individual that you're like, this guy's a killer, or this woman's a killer? Killer is, not, is a concept we, uh, or a term we throw around a lot. I do too. Uh, because we love to find, you know, killer CEOs uh, in, in a good sense, you know. And these are CEOs, I mean, I think the first thing is just the mindset. Are you there to create shareholder value? And is that reflected in your alignment with shareholders? I think that's really important. You know, if I see a CEO saying all the right things about alignment and shareholder value, but he doesn't own very many shares and his compensation isn't really based on creating shareholder value, then we're naturally going to raise an eyebrow and say, well, your actions don't really, are, are not very consistent with your words. On the other hand, we've seen really exceptional CEOs that hold a material portion of their net worth in their stock that don't sell stock over time, even add you know, at certain times and you know, really care about their employees, care about their shareholders and are creating value for everyone sort of in the ecosystem. And so, um, yeah, I would say, Finding CEOs that are aligned is really important and understand per share value creation. I think um, under, finding CEOs that really understand capital allocation is critically important. And you'd be, you'd be shocked. I mean, there are really large companies that you know, their CFO and or C CEO have no idea how to think about capital allocation. You know, I just I won't say the name, but you know, we were talking with the CFO of a 10 billion plus dollar consumer company recently and we asked the CFO you know how do you think about capital allocation across three very different businesses and you know she had an answer sort of a, a doctored answer prepared and went on for about 10 minutes rambling on how she thinks about capital allocation and 
She did not mention a single financial metric or hurdle in those 10 minutes, right? It was all about long-term brand building and all these other things. And it was really just shocking, right? Because that's somebody who doesn't understand capital allocation. That's somebody who doesn't understand per share value creation. And in her case, in the company's case, it really showed in poor returns over time. So, you know, it, it really just depends. You have small cap, you know, CEOs that really get it. You have large cap CEOs who don't. There's a whole there's a whole range, but it's it's a lot of fun because when you find a great CEO who really gets it, who leans into competitive advantages and grows those over time, I mean, there's there's tremendous value that can be created. I'll give one example. You know, there's there's someone named Ryan Pape at a company called Expel, and disclosure, we we do own and we have owned some Expel shares for a long period of time. But uh, you know, this this guy has created tremendous value for himself and shareholders. You know, he's got a material portion of his net worth in Expel stock. I don't believe he's ever sold a single share. You know, he he meets with shareholders regularly. He, you know, I've I've walked sort of their um, walked their floor of inventory. You can you can tell he knows every single worker by their first name. They really respect him, and you know, it just, it just shows because he works really hard. He's doing the he's doing it the right way, and um, you know, ultimately he's created a lot of value for shareholders, and so. Somebody like that versus some of the mega cap CEOs I've seen, it's it's really night and day. I can just picture you on that call as <laughs> as that person's talking about capital allocation. You're like, I cannot wait to follow up this, <laughs> this rant. Um, I'll just ask the dumbest question yet to date. What is capital allocation and what makes somebody good at it? So capital allocation is really... Um, it's really the process of understanding, you know, look, every every business is a function, right? You put a certain amount of capital in, you get a certain amount of capital out, and it depends where you invest, and you have a lot of different options. So if you're a CEO of a company or a CFO, you can invest internally in projects. You can try to create a new product. You can try to create a new division. You can invest outside of your business, right? You can go buy a business through M&A, inorganic growth. You can buy back your own stock if you're a publicly traded company. There's a lot of different things you can do. You can pay a dividend. There's a lot of different things you can do with the precious capital that shareholders have given you. And it's your job to evaluate the risk reward, similar to how we have a lot of different factors and how we think about IRR and what is the best risk adjusted route. You know, there should be a similar process inside of a company for a CEO and CFO. What is our best risk adjusted return on capital? And that can be a very complicated question inside of some businesses. But some mistakes we often see are, you know, companies will pursue growth at any cost, right? Their stock may be really cheap and they might be telling investors, I can't believe it. I can't believe our stock is down so much. Um, yet then they go out and they spend money to buy a business at a much higher valuation, right? Well, if your stock is so cheap, why wouldn't you take, you know, your business, you should know your business better than anyone else. Why don't you take that capital and buy back your own stock at a really attractive free cash flow yield? Isn't that a better risk adjusted return than taking on the risk of integrating an acquisition at a higher price, which introduces all different kinds of costs and risk and things like that. So, um, you know, the, you, you see these kinds of things all the time. I think very few management teams truly understand um, capital allocation, but the ones that do tend to create a lot of value over time. And is that just something you kind of learn on the job? I mean, you, clearly you don't learn that in business school. I mean, you can learn like what it means in a textbook, but from the ones that you've seen that do it best, is that just growing up in the business, knowing it so well that you just know where those dollars need to go? Or how do the best learn how to allocate capital well? I think it's a combination of one, knowing your own business yeah. really well, right? Because you start with what are the internal reinvestment opportunities. And if you're an exceptional business, you probably have some exceptional internal reinvestment opportunities. Or maybe you're an average or to good business, but you're trying to become exceptional. So maybe some of that capital is going towards trying to build your competitive advantage. Just having a really thoughtful process around, you know, where are my competitive advantages? Where are my weaknesses? How can I lean into my strengths, shore up those weaknesses? And then marrying that uh, quali those qualitative insights with sort of quantitative rigor to actually measure the financial returns measure the financial hurdles. That's why I cringe so much when the CFO is talking and doesn't mention a single financial metric because, okay, it sounds great to build a long-term brand. It sounds great. Of course, you want to you know do all these things, but what is the return on capital for your investors? And how are you going to measure whether you're successful or not? How are we going to keep management accountable? Right. Um, 
And you, you have to have, even the best qualitative plan has to have quantitative um, you know, hurdles and, and, and sort of check-ins to see if things are, are on track. All right, so we've made it all the way through. We've had our spirited debates. We've made it through DD, and this says buy. And we're going to allocate X amount of capital in the fund to buy this deal. Is the goal to just buy as much of that stock to fill that allocation up like as quickly as you can from that point on? Or do you use, is it like come in in layers? Like, is every stock different? Every stock's different. Every situation's different. You know, for larger companies, it's conceivable you could fill it, you know, within an hour, sometimes even faster. Um, you know, for smaller companies, it might be something where you're putting in an order with a given price level and you might be picking away in the market for, you know, a month or longer. So it really, it could be the case you're going and trying to find larger holders and tr trying to find blocks to buy. So it really, um, it really just depends on the company. And if you want to buy a block, do you have to have some subscription to something or you call an investment banker at a big bank and say, we're looking to buy a million shares. If you know somebody that wants to sell them, tell them we'll buy them. Yeah. So we work with a network of traders. And okay. so the traders will, you know, will sort of go down the shareholder list and say, we think that these guys are sellers. They'll contact the relevant trader there. So it's sort of through a trade trader intermediary. One thing I've always thought about is, okay, let's say you're having a good idea and this could take, you know, months to kind of develop and everything is looking like it's a green light, but the stock price starts going up. Like, do you ever get, um, like, shit, we gotta, we gotta get to a, a yes quicker. We're going to, it's going to be too high. Or do you just say, Hey, it's a go, but we're just going to wait for the stock to get back to this price. Uh, I'd love to say the answer is no. And we never get jittery. Um, but of course, you know. We're, we're subject to all re regular human emotions. And when you, when you do sometimes months of work and you feel like something's slipping away from you, um, that can be an uneasy feeling. But what we try to do to the best of our ability is stay very objective, very quantitative. We have a process. And you know if the facts are not changing, but the price is going up, then our IRR is by nature, by definition, coming down. And so it's becoming relatively less attractive. Now, it might be, still be really attractive if it started at a very high IRR, much better than everything else. But it's also possible that you know there's a there's a company where the facts also haven't changed, but the price has come down quite a bit. So now it's relatively more attractive. And so that's where I think it's really important to have that quantitative discipline yeah. and really stick to your process um, so that you can reallocate out of out of things that have maybe run run up quite a bit, but the facts haven't gotten better to things where maybe. Um, the prices come down and the facts are neutral to, to maybe even positive. All right. One more, one more kind of question going back to management calls. How long do they usually last? And do you have a favorite question that you will typically ask or is it totally different? Uh, so in terms of how long they last, um, typically 30 minutes to an hour. Yeah. Sometimes you'll get an hour, sometimes you'll get 30 minutes. Depends. Um, you know, if it's like a very serious topic and you're a large holder, it could be longer depending on what's going on, but that would be typical. Um, in terms of favorite question to ask, definitely depends on the company, but I mean, I really like to just hear their internal thoughts on capital allocation because you can, you can really tell if somebody gets it or if they don't. Um, I mean, to be honest, I've had management teams ask me like, what do, what do you mean? And that's, <laughs> that's not a good sign. Um, that's really not a good sign. I'll tell you that. Um, and, and then they get like, you know, mostly in small cap companies, larger companies are definitely at least trained to give a scripted answer to that. But I mean, that's, it's such a deep question, right? Because a company can start walking you through some of their internal initiatives and how they think about trying to gain market share in this geography and, um, or this product segment versus buying back their own stock versus inorganic m and I, I think that is a question that lends itself to a wide variation of responses. And you can sort of tell who's really sophisticated and gets it versus who's kind of pretending and faking it. So I really like that question. You know, I like to just ask about competitive advantages. Um, I like to ask about, you know, how they think the industry will develop three to, you know, over the next three to five years, because, yeah. you know, we're not only developing a view of, of a business, we're developing a view of an industry. And we, we need to have a view of who are the winners and who are the losers in this specific industry and why. Right. It could be the case that we think that this is a winner take most industry and therefore you want to be long the the eventual, you know, oligop 
oligopoly winners, right? You want to be long the few players who are ultimately going to command certain level market share. It could also be the opposite. It could be the case that you know those winners are desperate to buy out the smaller players, and so actually you want to be long the smaller players that are going to get you know um, acquired in in a roll up. Um, so there's there's just a lot of different ways industries develop, but we spend a lot of time on that because an idea. And this is something I try to really emphasize uh, to the research team is an idea is really powerful, a great idea, but a theme is is many times more powerful because a theme you can make money on in multiple ways. So to have a truly differentiated sort of industry view is much more valuable than having a differentiated stock idea because you can make money multiple ways with an industry view, probably over a period of many years. A stock idea, you buy it one day, maybe it goes up the next and you make money and that's great. Um, but but a theme is is even more powerful. Yep. Um, okay, you started with 10 million under management. You have a lot more under management now. Um, I think you. it's fair to say you kind of started with small caps, but that's kind of evolving in and of itself. Um, can you just talk to how the size of the business and how uh, maybe a focus from just small caps to maybe more of the broader market, like why is that all starting to happen and how you think about that? Yeah. So, you know, I'd say we've, we've grown a lot since inception, both uh, organically and inorganically with some really great partners that we're very thankful for. Um, you know, and as we've grown, I think our underlying philosophy has very much stayed the same. What we've done though is we've added a lot of resources. So we have a lot more research bandwidth today than we did when I started. We have a lot more tools at our disposal. And, you know, we have a lot more firepower when it comes to things like activism, right? Like if we see a problem, we have a lot more ability today than we did um, when I launched in April 2018 by myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, there are puts and takes, right? So we can't necessarily invest in the smallest companies that we used to before because of size, but we have more res more tools at our disposal uh, to invest in still a really large global opportunity set. And you know, it's it's funny when I when we analyze our returns since inception, our worst performing sort of market cap bucket has actually been the micro cap bucket. <laughs> um, whereas we've done much better in both small, mid and large caps. And so, you know, I think that's really just a function of I really prefer investing in very high quality businesses and that tends to just skew us a little bit higher market cap so we love to find those you know those small caps that become mid caps or those mid caps that become large caps really understand those competitive advantages and grow with those businesses over time so just and naturally as the amount of capital that you have under management grows you kind of can't play in the like you you kind of have to keep evolving is that right yeah the true um the true micro cap bucket that's that's true but uh unfortunately again we we didn't have as much success there as in other buckets anyways um so that that is true but you know now we're able to do a lot more things internationally for example just because we have more bandwidth and there's a lot of stuff and international stocks tend to take a little bit longer to research than us stocks for obvious you know scheduling differences language differences etc but you know, I, I think the available investment universe has really grown. We've also started to do some things on the private side, which is, I think, a growing area of emphasis for us. And I think um, a very exciting opportunity. Uh, we've, we've seen a lot of really interesting deals we've passed on. We did three private deals last year, all of different sort of shapes and sizes. But, you know, I think the key is to continue, you know, j just like a CFO of, of a business we'd speak to, you know, we have to look at Alta Fox and say, what are our best reinvestment opportunities? And I'm very excited about a lot of them in terms of adding bandwidth, in terms of adding capabilities, in terms of adding data, um, you know, capabilities. So there's a, there's a lot of things that I'm excited about in terms of improving our process. And if we can continue to do that, I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. All right. Um, how do you, I want to, we're going to talk about, we're going to kind of talk about opportunities and you kind of started this whole thing. You said the board is changing and the world is kind of changing right now but before we start there i just want to ask one more how do you decide to sell one of the 20 or 15 stocks that you're in because there's an opportunity better than something in the fund or because the thesis has played out or yeah it could be one of a, f a few reasons so one we could get the thesis wrong right if, if we get evidence that our original thesis is wrong 
We have to be very objective about that. We need to cut our losses as quickly as possible. I think we've generally done a good job of that since inception, but it's it's always important not to get married to your thesis. Um, if if you if you see evidence that you're wrong, you need to recognize it immediately and and make the corrective action in the portfolio. That's number one. Number two is you could be right. Like the the the, the stock could work out. It could reach a level that you thought it should have reached. It's reached your price target. It's now less attractive than other things in the portfolio just because the price went up. And so you end up reallocating those dollars from it was undervalued. Now it's closer to fairly valued. Let's allocate it back to something that's undervalued. So it could be just the stock moves in your favor, um, sort of the opposite of the first problem. Um, you know, it, it could be we have better opportunities um, or it could be sort of the macro environments change. So like a good example of this would be really COVID. So 2020 was a really extraordinary year in the markets. You know, a lot of change was happening in a short amount of time. And the market really struggled to know how to value businesses, even historically stable businesses, which was what made this so remarkable because you truly didn't know like were businesses going to be closed for how long? Like, are they going to have zero revenue? Like this was not a scenario many people had contemplated. And there was a lot of panic and fear naturally as a result. And so we had to sort of really re-underwrite the entire portfolio and say, where across all those those um, criteria I mentioned before, and say, what are the best, what are the best risk reward opportunities today? And we made a lot of changes. There was a lot of turnover, not because we didn't like the things we had, but because uncertainty. Um, this is another thing we didn't talk about, but conviction. So that's another thing that we score is an important um, criteria for us because you can think the stock's undervalued. You can have your own estimate of risk and everything else, but what's your conviction level? What are your real-time channel checks of the business health? How long have you analyzed the business? This is really important. Like, in other words, what are the chances that you're wrong? And we really reallocated to things at the bottom of the market that we had very high conviction in because we had, in many cases, real-time data checks of the business suggesting that actually these businesses were doing better than they were before. Right. Um, maybe they were online businesses that were benefiting um, from massive consumer behavior changes and spending changes. Um, Maybe they were benefiting from some of the, you know, overstocking of consumer items. Like there's just a lot of different consumer behavior that changed. We tried to have high conviction in some of those changes in behavior. And we ended up buying stocks that were down a lot based on fear and panic that all of our data was suggesting is actually getting better. So we were just buying them lower. They'd go down the next day. We'd buy a little bit more. And it was a very, look, well, it was a scary time for everybody, but, um, you know, I think that's that's another reason why you sell is is you just have better opportunities. This wasn't on our checklist of notes, but when you think back to like March fifteenth of twenty twenty, we'll call that the day that I always think the day that COVID started is the day that that the NBA announced that they were shutting the league down. Like that <laughs> for me is like the moment or the ma the the players championship. I think the following day said they were canceling. That's when I was like, okay, we're not in Kansas anymore. Walk me through like the next 30 days from there for you. Was it everybody in the world was freaked out what was going on? How long was it before you all started trading again? Did you wait? Did you just kind of wait to see if the government was going to print money? Like what needed to happen for you to start getting active again? I would love to say that we were perfectly calm and we had no fears, but that would be very much lying. Um, you know, look, it was, it was just an extraordinary period in the markets because there was so much uncertainty. Even about even over historically safe companies that were not considered volatile earning streams, and so you really had to first look at your existing portfolio and say, you know, where are my vulnerabilities here? What is the balance sheet strength? Right. Ultimately, we try to take a very bottom up view, and so what I did not want to do was to take in some COVID view and try to become a COVID expert and have a differentiated view on how soon or that we're going to open up sooner than people thought or later, I sort of said, look, this is what consensus is. We're going to follow this very closely. We're going to follow the, the data, but we're not going to deter determine our portfolio. We don't want that to be you know, the biggest determinant, determinant as to whether we outperform or underperform. Well, so what we tried to do was say, look, are there businesses out there where we can have conviction in, in, in a world of massive uncertainty? Where can we find certainty? And that became the most important variable in sort of our checklist over that period of time. Wow. And the answer is yes. 
there is a small subset of businesses in this really uncertain world of March 2020 that you could look at and say, look, it make you know we can track the whether it's um, web web traffic, we can track the various al alternative data. We can see that things are actually getting better. These business it makes sense qualitatively why they're getting better. We can underwrite um, sort of to the normalized earnings and free cash flow sort of pre-COVID. We can kind of estimate how these consumer changes will um, will benefit the business and what do we think it's worth. And so we ended up basically selling stock, a lot of stocks that we thought were very cheap, but we did not have a lot of certainty over because you know there were businesses in our portfolio that I hated to sell. I love the, the management teams. I love the business. But if COVID went lasted a little bit longer than consensus, that the equity might have flipped upside down. You know, there's, for example, there was one restaurant stock that we owned, really great management team, really great execution, but it was a really terrible time. They had just they had just levered up to buy another business at really the worst possible time right before COVID. And you know, like the CEO is like talking about selling like off their wine inventory to like raise cash. And it's like, man, you know, this is really serious. Like if COVID lasts a little bit longer, this thing could go bankrupt. And you know, they didn't. And I wish I had held the stock. But the reality is that that was the right decision at the time because we had no idea how long COVID would last. We certainly weren't going to, you know, have a make or break on a position with that being the prime determinant. And we shifted into names where we had really high conviction, really good channel checks, and we thought had equal, if not greater, upside. I love that. Um, you don't judge the decision based on maybe what ended up happening. It's how did you feel at the time? Did you go through your checklist and, um, you know, something that you can kind of lean on no matter what the situation throws at you. Um, all right. I want to get to activism for a bit. Um, share as much as you will, but, uh, recently I think I'll start it by just saying, you have built a phenomenal reputation when you release information to the market, the market listens. Uh, it seems like activism might be um, maybe easier for you to get done these days than other people, but you recently took an activist position. And I think we kind of touched on this um, and we can talk about it's Hasbro. How did you go from, I freaking love this idea so much to <laughs> I got to act on this idea? Sure. So we have been activists on multiple occasions now, Hasbro being the latest. I won't specifically talk about Hasbro, but I will share, you know, how we think about activism generally, because I think it's really important. You know, the first thing is, it's it's not something we we sort of look for. Um, it's sort of like, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's it's a last resort. You know, we want to work collaboratively with management teams. I think that's the healthiest um, participation you can have in the market is management teams trying to do the right things with boards trying to do the right things for you know shareholders who are in it for the right reasons and for the long term doesn't always work out that way when you've got you know human emotions and egos and everything else involved but you know look I think activism is really important and in fact I would say it is more important than ever in the markets and the reason I say that is everyone knows there's been this trend from active to passive management uh, within the US stock market and really global stock market and the net result of one of the most important and least talked about results of that is you end up with material percentages of companies held by passive investment funds, right? That do not have a view on the, on the stock and a fundamental view and are not, you know, often talking to the management team in many cases. And, you know, that's important because it, it, it in many cases can give management teams this comfort that they might not have if you had active holders that are sweating every year of underperformance, which I think is it to, to hold management accountable. So I think activism is, activism is really important because in a world where everything is passive, there's not anyone to sort of stand up necessarily and say, hey, you're abusing um, your, your boardroom privileges to overpay yourselves and or the management. You are not holding this executive accountable. You're doing things that are in your best interest instead of shareholders. There's a whole host of things that shareholders are supposed to keep, ultimately the board, which is, which is supposed to keep the management team accountable. So I think activism is, real, is very important. Um, you know, our, our approach to activism has 
and to have it be a last resort, but ultimately to make it about the facts. You know, I think uh, if you look at if you look at uh, shareholder value creation, if you look at how management teams and boards are compensated, you can pretty quickly see in most cases is this management team and board in it for themselves or in it for shareholders? And you can tell from the actions of the companies over many years. And the, in, the, in the cases where we've gone activist, we have identified uh, material issues between the interests of the management team and board and that of shareholders. We have tried to rectify those issues um, through collaboration. And we have run into, in most cases, a stonewalled board that does not like being held accountable by shareholders that ultimately own the company, not the board. And in those in those instances, I think it's important for shareholders to stand up and really make a claim to the company that they own, and in a way that is good for all shareholders. And you know, again, I think this this pa- this active to passive shift has made this more important than ever. But um, you know, it, it's an example where. The stock market is not a zero sum game. You know, it's an example where you can actually, if you can get positive change, right, by better aligning the people running the company with shareholders, you you have actually added to the ecosystem. You've you've created a positive change, and I think that's a great thing. So you so you say uh, we can just talk about any company in general, but you say, hey, you know, Mister Company. Uh, y'all aren't doing things that great. You're not taking care of the shareholders. We have a plan that would uh, do better for the shareholders. Um, and they say, well, yeah, look, we just don't disagree. Or we don't, we just don't agree. And then I, I, I think I know what a proxy vote is. You kind of, but is the goal of the activists to also alert all other shareholders that may have been like, oh shit, we, we didn't even think about this. Like, how do you kind of keep building consensus so that, um, cause you only own a few percent of the company. Like at what point can a company just totally swat everything away and they kind of end up victorious? Well, they can certainly try to do that. And I think the, the worst boards and management teams tend to try that. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, 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 you have corporate democracy, right? You get to vote in proportion to your shares. And so ultimately shareholders get to decide. Um, every year, who should be on the board at most companies? And you know, activism is basically you. You say, look, there are these issues. You try to resolve them with the company. You try to find a compromise. Um, if the company is unwilling to compromise, then you can take the next step, which is, look, we're going to put this to a vote, right? If you don't agree, I think shareholders will agree, and you make your case, and the company makes its case, and shareholders ultimately vote at the annual meeting. And if you're victorious, the shareholder is victorious, then you end up replacing um, numerous board members. And, you know, then it's up to them to create positive change, right? And uh, if you don't like the change you see, you can come back the next year. You know, it's, it's, it's a democratic process. It's, you know, um, it's related to how many shares you own. But yes, you've got to make that appeal to other shareholders and say, look, I, I am more aligned as a shareholder with your interests as a shareholder. We've done a lot of work. We've identified these issues. We've identified these opportunities, and we have the right people to enact this change relative to existing board members that, in most cases of activism, are not very aligned, are very complacent, and do not, in many cases, really care what happens to the share price or shareholders. So to your point on uh, more of an active investor being more valuable than ever, in general, are you seeing more folks become active investors again, or is the trend still to be passive? Um, in terms of activism trends, I definitely think it's more important than ever. I think in some ways it's become more difficult just with the growth of passive holders because it's it's typically easier to get active holders um, convinced that, um, hey, look at the share price. It's underperformed. You can see these actions. It's You can get to a decision quicker. But um, yeah, I, I think it's more important than ever. I think, um, you know, there's there's a lot of smart activists globally. I think activism has also often had this negative connotation, but activism has evolved over many decades, right? 
Um, there used to be like really fiery letters and things like that, like the Carl Icons of the world and the Dan Loeb's. And you know, look, there's there's still some of that today, but I think I think that's mostly gone away. And you know, certainly we try to really take a fact based approach and say, yeah. look, this these are the facts as we see them. The management can have their own narrative, but here's here's what we see. Here's what we're we're putting forward and shareholders can decide whether they agree or not. And I think that's a healthy process. When I think about, you know, a business, you know, a capitalist society of businesses there to, sh- to serve its shareholders, we can agree on that. Yes. A lot of these passive uh, holders of stock are pushing this new narrative that's been around for a bit called ESG, which you could make an argument is actually not to benefit the shareholders, it's to benefit ESG, whatever that means. And there's not very many quantitative, um, you think about KPIs, it's kind of this like, just do better is kind of the the deal. Is that making businesses better? Do you stay away from businesses? Is that a, like, how do you think about that? Well, I think ESG is really interesting because there's three letters in there. And I think often some of the letters get more attention uh, in the context of ESG than, than others. In particular, I think G is often very ignored, right? Governance, right? You hear a lot about environment and social, and those can have, um, you know, real legitimate reasons behind them. And there, there are legitimate questions about the value for all stakeholders and society and things like that. But you know, we focus a lot on the G on governance because ultimately, if you don't have proper governance, if you don't have people that are aligned with shareholders, then you 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 have no chance of having the company be properly run and misaligned incentives will inevitably um, destroy value and, and lead to suboptimal outcomes. Yeah. So we focus a lot on G. I think um, in terms of the, the rest of ESG, that's, that's probably a, a, a valid question for, for political debate. We, yeah. we try not to get, get too involved, but I do think that you know, if you take a long-term view of value creation, which we certainly do, that some of those values can be consistent with long-term value creation versus short-term, because there are often short-term costs for long-term benefits. So it's a complicated question. I think it depends on the details. I think it's a valid debate to have, but what I would certainly say and have a strong opinion on is G does not get enough attention in ESG, and I think activism can play a very important role in that. More G, baby. (laughs) All right. to the 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 extent that you'll share what's in your mind, um, you said one of the things that got you in this business is that you were a um, uh, a gamer growing up, and that investing was the perfect way to express a board that's kind of always changing. Maybe your answer is things are not changing, but you know we're at war now. Inflation's kind of running. Interest rates are going up. It seems like it's different than. Um, you know, we just came out of COVID. I, it's just a very general question. The board's is the board changing in your mind, and, and like, how do you think about the market? I'm not asking you to be a future predictor, but like, what are you thinking right now? Yeah, I mean, I think to some extent the board's always changing, but there's there are things that also stay the same. And you know, look, I think it's been a really challenging market environment, and I think one of the reasons is there really hasn't been anywhere to hide. You know. Um, the year kind of started with some of the high multiple software winners that have been stock market darlings over the last several years really getting crushed. You know, I think that had a really negative impact on many funds that you know had a heavy concentration in these names and were feeling really good over the last several years. A lot of those have really come down to earth. Um, you know, I think from a macro perspective, as you accurately said, you know, inflation has made cash not a good option. Right, you know, often you say, "Well, we'll hide in cash and sort of think, see how things go." Well, you've got a a pretty guaranteed uh, negative return um, in cash given very high inflation. Um, and then, you know, bonds, same thing. Like you can't really get any real yield in bonds today. So, at the end of the day, where do you hide? And I think the answer is, and this is where it stays the same: is you have to find high quality businesses. That have pricing power that can pass along those those inflationary costs, and you know really protect a 
high return on invested capital over time. And I do think that there are a lot of opportunities that are presenting itself in this market, but you've just got to be careful about you know, what type of macro environment are you underwriting? Because again, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty there in a different way than March 2020, but still a very important way. And so you've got to find those businesses that can succeed in most economic environments and, and try to emphasize the idiosyncratic bottom-up thesis and de-emphasize the macro, which is admittedly is very difficult to do, particularly in, in a market with some pretty unusual macro things going on, like the really high inflation that you've talked about. Yeah. In, in Europe, do you have an opinion on how really high inflation ends up stopping? Well, you know, they say the, I, I mean, ultimately, interest rates are being raised and will continue to be raised. And I think that's the, that's the real answer. But, um, you know, they also say the cure for high prices is, is high prices, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, um, ultimately I think there needs to be more fiscal responsibility. You know, it's there not too long ago. Um, there were many people, including with shockingly, you know, economic degrees and PhDs saying we can just print a bunch of money and like, there are no consequences. Um, I think we see that there actually are consequences. It turns out shockingly. And, you know, here we are with really high inflation. We've distorted the labor market quite considerably. And, you know, we, we have to just, I think, be more, be more disciplined and really have uh, real conversations around um, government spending and sort of what's gone on in the economy. But there's no question the economy is sort of overheated. It seems as if we might have to enter a recession to cool that off. Um, we'll see. But... You know, I, I think if any positive can come out of it, it's that maybe we can learn the lesson that uh, and, and maybe get a little bit more fiscal responsibility, though I wouldn't necessarily be holding my breath. Yeah. That. Cash is, like you just said, you can't really hide in cash. If Warren Buffett was sitting here right now and you're looking at him and he's like, yeah, I'm sitting on $150 billion of it or whatever he's sitting on now. <laughs> You think that's more a function of just like the law of numbers, like there's nowhere to put it. He hasn't obviously ever given him a dividend or is is the greatest investor of all time maybe just saying, I'm just going to keep waiting this one out until it's time. You know, I'd probably hand him a, a list of my portfolio and say, hey, there's some really great companies for sale <laughs> um, and start pitching them. But other than that, you know, I think, look, Warren Buffett has such an amazing track record and, you know, I think any aspiring investor should really study all of his letters. There's so much wisdom in there. I think people are a little hard on him today. I mean, he's he's getting up there yeah. <laughs> to say the least. And um, I, I don't know what his, his daily grind looks like, but he's got a lot of cash to deploy. Um, I'm a little surprised by how much cash he's holding, but uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to be in his position trying to allocate Whatever, whatever the tens of billions it is today. Do you have an investing idol or somebody that you really look up to? I've got a lot of investing idols. Okay. You know, I'd say one that immediately comes to mind that maybe is a little less well known in sort of mainstream media would be Joel Greenblatt. So Joel Greenblatt, in, in my opinion, had one of the greatest investing track records. Um, he ran a firm called Gotham Capital, and he compounded, I forget the exact number, but basically 50% a year for well over a decade. Wow. And you know, he was really a pioneer in early special situations. So he would find really complicated securities and situations that others might have been turned off from. He's best known for uh, sort of really being an early expert in spin-off uh, situations, which are much better understood today. But he was really early in that, understanding the forced selling dynamics, creating opportunities, and analyzing the incentives, and just taking a really creative mindset to at what at the time was a rather obscure sort of corporate transaction that many people didn't fully understand. But he he evolved and did a lot of different things over his time. I think he had a really creative way of thinking about value and he put up an amazing track record. And I'd encourage people to to read Joel Greenblatt's sort of Columbia Business School notes because he's taught at Columbia for a long period of time. You can find them out there on the internet. I think maybe the most valuable um, investing literature out there, I would say. Wow. Really, really great stuff. He's he's a master and he taught a class and I think anybody who wants to be great should read it. Um, but Joel Greenblatt's up there. I would say, you know, Peter Lynch has had a really great track record, a little bit different market environment, but he managed a lot of money, put up really great returns. And 
was really sort of an encyclopedia of information on stocks, knew right. a lot about a lot of stocks with a very sort of common sense approach. Yeah. You know, if anyone who has listened to Peter Lynch um, in various videos he's done over, over time, I think can appreciate the simple approach he took, uh, but just executed at a very high level. So I really like uh, Joel Greenblatt, Peter Lynch. Obviously, we talked about Warren Buffett, um, but there's there's so many. There's and, you know there's not one way to invest uh, at a high level. Um, I think there's some commonalities around fundamental investors over time, but I think you can ultimately try and pick off the things you appreciate and respect most about certain investors. But ultimately, you have to take those insights and apply it to yourself because. Investing is a very personal endeavor and it has to match your own personality yep. because when you're faced with a lot of uncertainty, when you're faced with a lot of fear, you ultimately will go back to your own personality. And so you have to craft your, your own investing process around that rather than try to be somebody else. Yep. All right. Um, one more question that I, w I picked a few from the, the Twitter audience to go through. But this one's for our hometown, Fort Worth. Buffett says that it's been an advantage of him being in Omaha because it's kind of a less distraction from the, your typical financial centers. Fort Worth's not a mega financial center. Not yet, Chris. Not yet. We're <laughs> starting it. We're about a mile down the street from each other. But how's running a hedge fund in Fort Worth? Like you could be in Dallas down the road or you could be in New York. Why'd you choose Fort Worth? First of all, I love Fort Worth. Um, yeah. Maybe not as much as, as, as you do, but uh, maybe I'm second in terms of loving Fort Worth. But I love Fort Worth. I think it's a great spot. And yes, I think in many ways it has been an advantage. You know, look, I worked in New York for a number of years at a large fund. I went to a lot of idea dinners. I rubbed elbows with really smart people all the time. And that was a great time in my career and I really loved it. But it can also lead to a lot of groupthink. You know, you get people pitching the same ideas and I think it's valuable to build that network, particularly early in your career. But I think it's really important to stay independent minded and yeah. really come to your own conclusions based on your own analysis and be able to tune out the noise. And there's a lot of noise in New York City. And I personally prefer to be in in, in a place like Fort Worth where um you know, we, I don't talk to any other really hedge fund investors in the area ever, honestly. <laughs> Maybe I should more. I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I think it uh, it's a different environment and one that, at least at least for me, seems to work well. Uh, when you're recruiting, are you recruiting people from out of town to come in? Or are you usually just training people that are here in Fort Worth or a mix of both? It's been a mix of both. Yeah. So I've had somebody move back here from Miami. I've got somebody begrudgingly who commutes from Dallas. I'm working on that. Um, I've had some, you know, multiple people move down from New York. You know, look, I think one benefit is that Texas is a place that people generally want to come to. You know, mm -hmm. the, Texas, obviously the low tax rates, the mild weather, like there's a lot of things that are great about Texas and Fort Worth. And I think it's become easier than ever to find really talented people who want to leave high cost states like, like New York. Um, and elsewhere and move to a place like Texas, particularly as they think about starting families and things like that. So I think it's a trend we have in our favor, um, but it's it's something we we constantly evaluate, but it's 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 been a great blessing so far to be uh, to be in Texas and specifically to be in Fort Worth. All right, we're gonna pull a few Twitter questions then we'll bring it home. You've been generous. Is Connor planning an update to the case study making of a multi-bagger? Has anything changed since he first published it? Uh, that that's a fun question. So, uh, making a multi bagger. So this was a an intern project. We had th uh, three interns one summer. Um, sort of COVID derailed a lot of internships for people in a kind of really sad way. Which you know, there's a lot of sad things around COVID. But I know the stress of being you know in college and trying to get that perfect internship and everything else. And so one thing we tried to do is offer remote internships to people during COVID that had their internships canceled who were really qualified through no fault of their own. And we ended up having um, a collection of really highly qualified interns. And I gave them like this massive project. I said, look, we're going to analyze some of the best performing stocks over the last five years. And uh, we're going to deconstruct the success. And so it was essentially a hundreds of pages. I forget how many pages. It was, I think, over 300 pages yeah. of analysis um, analyzing, I forget, 100 stocks or something like that, um, the most successful stocks over the last five years. 
and trying to draw conclusions and qualitative insights. So it's a, a, a series of case studies you can find on our website for free. It's a lot of fun. I think it's really helpful. I really believe in doing case studies, but it was a great project. Will we be updating it? Um, the short answer is I've been asked this before. I hope so at some point. Um, I will not be doing it entirely myself because it is a massive endeavor. But one thing I have toyed around with, which if I ever get the time, I would absolutely love to do is to basically do an update um, you know, for at some point in the future over the last five years, maybe do a little bit fewer companies, but get a little bit more in depth, really talk to the management teams of each of these companies, how they thought about it, things like that, and maybe package it as like a book for charity, for yeah. example, and like just give 100% of the proceeds away and like do something like that. I, I think that'd be really cool. I think we could do it, but uh, it won't be right now, but it's, it's something I, I'd like to do if, if possible at the right time. Okay. If you're a super intern out there, this could be the thing for you. <laughs> um, okay, he's mentioned looking at new horizons for scalable edge, including expressing an interest in utilizing options to express his trades. Where is he at in that process? Yes, we, that's, that's an area that's definitely grown for us. So when I started, we basically didn't trade any options. Um, today, it's a regular process of our evaluation and we're regularly trading some options. You know, we're always trading options primarily from a fundamental perspective. So we're trading options on companies that we already are invested in, in most cases, at least. And ultimately, it's just another way of expressing a fundamental view. But, you know, there are times that, um, vol vol you know, when you buy or sell an option, you're essentially trading volatility on an underlying instrument along with other other factors. But there are times when that volatility becomes very expensive. There are times when that volatility becomes very cheap. And so in general, we're trying to sell very expensive volatility. We're trying to buy very cheap volatility in a way that is um, consistent with our fundamental views of, of, of the company. So today, it's not just an evaluation of should we buy the stock or not? It's, okay, what kind of position do we want to have in the stock? How should we structure that between equity versus options. The vast majority of what we do is still equity, but we're sometimes able to um, create a trade that is more attractive than only buying the equity. And that's an area our, our capabilities have grown quite con quite considerably. All right. Dumb question. What is cheap volatility versus <laughs> expensive volatility? Is, is there an easy answer to that? Uh, yeah. Uh, in simple terms, you know, volatility obviously just measures basically how much a stock is moving back and forth, yeah. right? and uh, up or down. And so there are times when when you buy or sell an option, you're essentially trading the implied volatility going forward. That option has a price. Part of the determination of that price is the expected volatility going forward. So you can, you can look and see, well, what is the implied volatility? How does that compare to the historical volatility? How does that compare versus our own fundamental views? And so if, for example, you're selling a put option on a company that you have strong fundamental conviction in and it has very high volatility, you could potentially could be, um, you're, you're essentially, you could be selling insurance to somebody else, taking in an unusually large premium because of the high volatility and taking advantage of that Got for it. your own fundamental position. I'm glad I don't compete against you. <laughs> uh, all right, three more. Would he have taken Warren Buffett up on his bet regarding hedge funds versus the S&P 500? Would he take that bet today? Yeah, so this relates to I think it was Ted Seides made the bet with uh, Warren Buffett about the performance of of hedge funds over time, and Warren Buffett famously won the bet. Um, I'd say a few things. One, no, I don't think I would take the bet. Um, you know, in general, it, well, it really, it also really depends on the market environment. You know, no hedge fund is the same. There's it encompasses a lot of different strategies. You have market neutral hedge funds. You have things that are more like long onlys and everything in between. So it depends a little bit on the market environment, but look, I would say hedge funds are typically trying to um, solve or, or typically trying to um, accomplish a specific goal, and that can be different things. Some, again, some are looking for low volatility. Some are trying to maximize returns through a cycle, regardless of volatility. It really depends. But you know, I would say, look, I think um, it's been a difficult business because of fee compression, uh, low barriers to entry, et cetera. I think it will continue to be a difficult business. Frankly, they're probably too many hedge funds out there. Um, I think that you have to be really honest about what your edge is and what your edge is not. And 
there are a lot of people that want to take your job <laughs> every yeah. day. So you've got to really earn your right to compete and earn the right for your fees, you know, every every year. And if you don't, you'll ultimately see, you know, outflows. And that's a healthy thing. I mean, it's a market, it's competitive and um, you know, dollars should flow to the highest rates of return and and ultimately of risk adjusted return and sort of the best processes over time. So no, I don't think I would take a collection of best today. Now, if you said, hey, Connor, you can pick five you, you, you well, uh, I wasn't <laughs> gonna say that, but if you can pick, you know, five funds, five to ten funds that you personally know of managers and compare that over a full market cycle, um, I would take that because I, I know a lot of really talented people and I definitely believe that there are people with superior processes that in the majority of scenarios will outperform over time. Yep. Was there anything you took from maybe maybe answer this however you want from the Melvin Capital situation and or this kind of meme stock revolution where people now can express frustration with the world through buying a stock. Like has that changed at all how you think about what you're doing or like yeah, yes is the short answer. Okay. And I think it has to actually because you know, look, as this stuff was there, there was a point in time where I saw Kodak, I think it was it, go up something like 10x or 13x in a period of 24 or 48 hours. And this was, you know, a bad business, like a secularly declining business, and they won some con some government contract that was kind of like a sham and you know, I think the management team had like basically I mean, I think they're under some inquiries around how they traded the stock ahead of time. There was just weird stuff going on all over, we'll say. And, you know, look, um, I had like nightmares about this because we were not involved at all. But I thought to myself, what if we had a 1% short position in Kodak, right? A 1% short position in a business that you would normally think doesn't have a lot of upside risk, right? Like, how are you really going to get killed? It's not like they're going to come out with some product and it's going to multiply the business didn't matter. Fundamentals didn't matter. And this was the case across a lot of stocks, GameStop being uh, the, the big one everybody you know, has talked about. The fundamentals were kind of irrelevant. Um, and it became, what are they targeting next? And so, yes, uh, I sort of made the determination after seeing the Kodak example, not, not being involved, that the risk reward on individual shorts at that point in time was simply not worth it. One, because there was no way to predict, you know, we could have a 1%, literally 1% short position in a secular declining business. It could potentially blow up your entire fund. And that is not worth it. Um, and then the second thing being, I would not have gotten any sleep at all because I would have worried that, oh man, this 1% short is going to blow us up. And so we, at the time, shifted from, you know, individual named shorts to more broad-based um, approaches and themes, which, you know... I think was the right risk adjusted decision. And I think these things are cyclical. I think that there are times when um, shorting can make a lot of sense. Um, there are times when maybe it doesn't. And that was a particular time when the risk just far outweighed the reward. And what was happening in those situations were these basically people were finding out that these big wealthy hedge funds on Wall Street were short these companies that in theory they loved like GameStop. And they were basically just saying, we're going after that guy and the way we're going to do it is just keep buying the stock. Yes, that is essentially correct. Um, and I would say also sort of crowdsourcing that mentality on Reddit in particular. And, you know, look, I, I, um, I, I have a, a lot of, of thoughts on it. I mean, look, I think a lot of it's unfortunate because ultimately, sure, you know, if people want to get excited about going after some hedge fund. It's a market. They can do whatever they want. But ultimately, there were a lot of people that were hurt who were individual investors that were you know, following into a speculative-driven um, company through out-of-the-money call options that they really didn't understand. And many of them lost a lot of money. You, know, you hear about the people who made the money and gloat about it, but there's a lot of people who lost Money, you know, wealth that they really couldn't afford to lose, and I think that's I think that's the real tragedy. Um, and so I, I don't love the idea. I don't think it's healthy market activity. I don't love the idea of individual investors buying out of the money uh, instruments on speculative stocks that are divorced from fundamentals. I think it's very unhealthy for the markets. I think it's very un unhealthy ultimately for the individuals participating. 
And, you know, people, I guess, should have the right to do whatever they want. But I, I, I would hope that it would be an area of emphasis for regulators because, again, um, it's the individual investors who ultimately get hurt. And I think that's that's kind of a tragedy. Yep. Is, uh, is it fair to say that, that, that forums like Reddit would be a place that you do research or blogs or where there's social activity. Hey, what are people talking about? Or do you kind of stay away from that stuff? <laughs> uh, certainly not Reddit. Um, you know, there are some things we read and participate in, but certainly not Reddit. The only reason we really check Reddit is to try and understand what's going on. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this is up so much. Is Are people talking about it on Reddit? Like particularly around sort of the GameStop time, that was highly relevant because you needed to be aware of like what were people what were people are attacking and what is explaining these otherwise, you know, unexplainable moves in stocks. So um, pretty kind of crazy even to talk about, but um, we don't we don't do much of that. It's it's very much bottom up focused based on our own search process. We try to really stick in our lane and and filter out the noise the best we can. All right. One more. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. This was part of your three facts. So now we're just going to totally ditch investing. We've <laughs> talked enough about it. You have a distaste for sushi that is out of the norm. <laughs> I love sushi. So tell me what's the problem here? Well, Scotty Chris, you, sh loves sushi. you should have told me that before I came in. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's true. And my wife hates it because she loves sushi. I I don't know what to say. I, I think, um, I, you know, I didn't always hate sushi. I I think I had a bad experience. I think it kind of upsets my stomach a little bit. So I, I don't know. I'm sure there's some amazing sushi out there, but uh, we're going to have to pick a different restaurant spot. All right. That's fair. <laughs> if somebody wants to get in touch with you uh, or check out what you're doing on your website, how can they find you? Yeah. You know, our website's um, altafoxcapital.com. You know, our you can follow us on Twitter. That's uh, at Alta Fox Capital is a great way to follow sort of what we're doing. Um, and, you know, they can email us at info at altafoxcapital.com. But, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty transparent in our research process. And, um, yeah, uh, really, really appreciate coming on. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, Connor.